the quest for a genius tutor, navigating luxury and loss. They opened up large pieces of land next to the new road for fancy housing. Big houses started appearing. For people already living by the lake, GRT still owned the land south of the old rail line and kept it from being developed. The agreements about lakefront property stayed the same, so no new homes would be built there. Once Christie learned more about the man, she looked into his past and found out he was truly a math genius. His education was top-notch, and his work at the university made her wish he was still teaching. Some people even described him as a big, cuddly teddy bear, who was also great at math. She looked at old photos from the university and saw how he earned his reputation over the years. He was 53 when the crash happened and still big. She imagined him now at 58, maybe using a walker or a wheelchair if the injuries were as bad as they said. Still, she only needed his mind to help her solve her current problem. As Chrissy drove past a bunch of big fancy homes, she shook her head. The land around them was bare. She thought they should have planted big trees like in her parents' neighborhood. Ahead, she saw the rail trail crossing the new road and noticed no one coming. She drove over the small bump and into the forest. Soon she turned onto the old lakefront road. Christy checked the envelope again for the house number she needed. Tyson's house was farther down, so she kept driving, enjoying the view. All the homes were on the lakeside of the road and many had gates, which seemed silly to her as they were open to the lake. Thankfully all the homes were one story and blended into the natural surroundings. Some were wider to make up for not having a second floor. As she saw the numbers getting closer to her destination, she slowed down and turned into a gravel driveway. There was no other car there, so she worried he might not be home. The house was charming. It was a ranch-style cottage hidden among the trees with many unique design touches. She almost expected to see magical creatures in the lush gardens around the house. Shutting off the engine, she stepped out and took a deep breath of morning air. It smelled so fresh and clean. She checked her outfit one last time. She wore her best business clothes, a red silk blouse, black slacks and low-heeled red leather shoes to match her top. She didn't want to overdo it, so she chose a top that didn't cling too much. She didn't have any pants that weren't flattering, so she picked black to maybe make her curves less noticeable. Gathering her courage, she got ready for her pitch and climbed the three steps to the front door. She pressed the doorbell and heard it ring faintly inside. After a long moment, she pressed it again. Still nothing. Christy hadn't planned for this. She had many ideas for talking to him, but none if he just wasn't there. Standing on the front step, she looked around. Maybe he visited a neighbor? The fact that there wasn't a car in the driveway and no garage made it clear he wasn't home. Come on. You can do it. Don't give up. The morning was so quiet that Christy heard a faint voice to her left. She saw a single-story house next door with a rooftop deck. An older woman with white hair was standing there, holding binoculars and looking towards the water. Curious, Christy went down the steps and walked to the side of the house. She saw a gate marked private, but she decided to go through it anyway. The path ran between the house and a tall hedge to the backyard. Even though the hedge went straight to the water's edge, she could tell the house was much deeper than it looked from the front. It must have been quite big inside. She heard coughing and gasping and looked towards the water. Someone was trying to climb out of the lake. He managed to stand up, but then fell back to his hands and knees, breathing heavily. She moved to help. A loud roar stopped her and she watched him from the corner of the house. He stood up again. He was naked. He stood still, eyes closed, trying to catch his breath. Once he was steadier, he walked out of the water towards the house. He ran his hands through his long black hair, squeezing out the water. His hair had gray patches at the temples. Christy didn't know what to do. She was there to see Professor Kane, not this fit-looking stranger. He wasn't bulky, but his muscles were very defined. He had a slight limp and scars around his knee. It looked like he had knee surgery. She tried not to stare at his body, but it was hard. He suddenly spoke, making her jump. Who are you and why are you trespassing? 
His voice was deep and angry. Christy stepped away from the house. I'm Christy Taylor. I'm here to see Professor Kane. The man frowned and walked to a chair with a robe on it. He put the robe on, tying it around his waist, but kept looking at her angrily. There's no one by that name here. Go away. Ah, uh, Professor Haley told me he lived here. He sent me to speak to Professor Kane, she said, more confidently now that he was covered. The man's face showed discomfort. George Haley? Yes, I have a letter from him to give to Professor Kane, she said, feeling hopeful. Maybe this man knew where Tyson Kane was. She handed the letter to him. He held out his hand. She blinked at it, then back at his annoyed face. Give me the letter, he growled. She frowned. No, I need to give it to Professor Kane directly. I told you there is no Professor Kane here, just Tyson Kane. That's me. Give me the letter. Christie's eyes widened. She stared at him. He waved his fingers impatiently. You, you can't be him. His face showed confusion. What do you mean? Of course I can. He's, he's almost sixty. You can't be that old, she exclaimed. He snorted, then looked serious again. Listen, I don't have time for this. Give me the letter or leave. If you're him, why did you say there's no one here by that name, she insisted. His scowl returned. I said there's no Professor Kane here. That man died five years ago. I haven't taught since then. He looked deeply troubled. Christie's mouth dropped open. This was Tyson Kane, but he looked so different. She had to admit he looked much better than in the old pictures. The letter? She quickly handed him the envelope. He sighed deeply and opened it. While he read, Christie couldn't help but admire his body again. It had been a long time since she felt this way. Tyson unfolded the paper with a mix of feelings. The writing on the envelope was George's. His eyes quickly read the message. Dear Tyson, I hope this letter finds you well. The woman standing before you is Miss Christy Taylor. She's in my class, and over the past few months, her grades have suddenly dropped. She's usually really smart, so this change is strange. I don't know why it's happening. You might wonder why you should care. Well, it would mean a lot to me if you could find some time to see what's wrong and help her out. I owe her dad a good amount of money from a bad night of poker. He said he'd let it go if I help his daughter. I can't change her grade myself, so tutoring is the only option. I can't show favoritism, and I think only you can help her improve quickly. Please don't mention the gambling debt to Miss Taylor. I want her to believe she earned her grades by herself. Thank you for considering it, your friend George. Tyson sighed deeply. He didn't want to do this, but he couldn't say no to George. George was his only friend who still visited, even though Tyson knew he was a bad host. That was more a Manny's thing. He folded the letter and put it back in the envelope, just stalling while thinking of what to say to the young woman in front of him. Will you do it? She asked. He looked into her eyes and felt himself about to nod. Did anyone ever say no to her? He kept a straight face. I haven't had my breakfast yet. Tell me why I should help you. He led her to the living room. When he offered her a seat, he saw her looking around with delight. It made him look too, but all he saw were reminders of who was no longer there. His mood dropped. He walked to a small wood stove heating the room, opened the door, and tossed in George's letter. As it burned, he turned back to his guest. I need to shower and get dressed. Then I'm making breakfast. Have you eaten? He asked. She quickly nodded. But I'd love an espresso or a coffee if you're making some. He frowned and pointed to the machines in the kitchen. He never learned how to use them, but George had brought some special beans last time and made espresso for both. It works, but I don't know how to use it. If you do, go ahead. Tyson left to shower, shave, and dress in tan shorts and a black shirt. He put a bit of unscented balm on his aching knee. Taking a deep breath, he walked back to the living room. He saw Miss Taylor using the espresso machine. 
It was working fine, so he assumed she knew what she was doing. She turned to smile at him. She suddenly looked very familiar. This machine is great. So much better than the one my parents have at home, she said excitedly. That feeling of familiarity vanished with her excitement. I prefer plain black coffee, but a manny liked espresso, he said without interest. She gave him a kind smile, and he focused on the fridge to make breakfast. He grabbed two eggs, some yogurt, spinach, and a few tomatoes. While making scrambled eggs, he watched her work the machine. She made two small cups of espresso. These beans are really good, she said happily. He nodded slightly. George brought them over. She nodded and finished. Their espresso was ready. When I got here, I didn't see a car. Did you walk to town? I don't drive, he said bluntly. Because of a yes, he cut her off. She paused. She slid his cup towards him, and he nodded thanks. How do you get groceries? She asked. They deliver, he replied tiredly. He sipped the espresso. It was strong, but good. He smiled at her hopeful look, and she beamed. That sense of recognition returned, but he couldn't place it. You have a beautiful home. Is that door for a second bedroom? She asked, pointing to a door near his room. Most of what was in there belonged to a manny. Yes, but it's just storage and where I work out. Tyson finished making breakfast and took it to a small table by the patio doors to look at the lake while eating. Miss Taylor thought it was an invitation to sit between him and the view. She smiled at him and his irritation spiked. He felt pressured and didn't like it. Did George tell you I don't teach idiots? He blurted out, regretting it immediately. Yes, Professor Haley said I have to prove I'm worth your time, she answered calmly. And? Taylor continued with her presentation as Tyson listened quietly, eating his breakfast. He found himself nodding at parts he liked, and she seemed to sit up straighter each time he did, her smile showing she appreciated the small praise. When she finished and explained how her grade was dropping, he remembered what George had said about the mystery. He had to agree. This woman had so many advantages, yet her grades were falling, and she did nothing to fix it. Why? he asked plainly. Her smile wavered. She thought she had explained why. Seeing her confusion, he clarified, No, why are your grades slipping? She went silent, thinking about it. Finally, she seemed to find an answer. My other classes are easy for me. I feel like I know all the material already, but this class is harder and I need to put in more effort. And you haven't put in more effort because... Her eyes met his and her smile faded. He saw a glimpse of sadness, a feeling he knew well. Think about your blessings, he said, and her face darkened. Anger flared in her eyes. Listen, I know I'm lucky to be born into wealth and privilege. She began getting worked up. Tyson shook his head. No, it's a mental exercise. List the things you are thankful for. She blinked at him. Are you evaluating my mind? She asked, realizing what he was doing. He gave her a serious look. If I'm going to help you, I need to know if the problem is just about the subject, or if it's also emotional. Each needs a different approach. He wanted to tell her he couldn't handle someone else's emotional problems right now, but he stayed quiet. She nodded and thought about her blessings, as he called them. Nothing specific, just general ideas, he clarified, and she gave him an annoyed look. She cleared her throat. I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for my friends. I'm thankful for my fiancé. I'm thankful for being able to attend this university. I'm thankful for... Stop. You just listed the biggest sources of potential happiness. People. Which one isn't true? She made a sound of shock, but Tyson pressed on. Your parents. Is your dad pushing you to do something with your life? Is your mom too critical of your choices? He asked. No, they're not like that at all. They've been very supportive, she replied sharply. Tyson noticed something in her expression. So they support something you disagree with. Let's move on, he said, making her angrier. He didn't care. He had nothing to lose. 
he understood why George wouldn't change her grade. Tyson was also trying to keep his honesty as a teacher, even if he didn't want to return to teaching. Your friends. Do you have any fake friends in your group? Someone you don't trust? Someone acting against you? He asked. Again, no. I don't let toxic people get close to me. She snapped. Tyson nodded. Then it must be the fiancé. Is he too pushy? Not pushy enough. Has he hurt you? He would never. She gasped, watching him like he was crazy. But he doesn't make you happy, Tyson asked, picking up on her hesitation and taking a guess. Miss Taylor stood up and walked around the table. Tyson saw the slap coming, but didn't stop it. He'd felt worse pain. Christy stormed out of the house and got into her car before the tears came. She wasn't sure why she was crying. She told herself it was because of his rude behavior, but deep down, she knew that wasn't the whole truth. He had been right and she couldn't handle it. She allowed herself to cry for a moment, then slowly stopped. She couldn't give up, or she'd fail the course. She didn't want to prove him right, that she wasn't capable. She was capable. Christy got out of the car and grabbed her bag of books and notes from the back seat. She took a deep breath and walked back to the house. Be brave or go home. She marched up to the front door and rang the bell. Moments later, Tyson opened the door, looking suspicious through the screen. I'm sorry for slapping you. His expression didn't change. No, you're not. You had a reason. I was rude. She paused. Can I come back in? He sighed and stepped aside, letting her in. She walked to the table and set her bag down. He frowned at it. I haven't agreed to teach you yet. You've identified what's affecting my grades. Only part of the problem. Identifying it is a good start, but you need a plan to fix it, or it will keep holding you back, he said. I'm calling off the wedding, she declared, surprising herself with how good it felt to say. A weight lifted from her shoulders. Tyson raised his eyebrows. That seems drastic for a small issue. You could go to counseling for that. She shook her head. It's not just that. She thought for a moment. With the decision made, other truths came forward. I think we're too much alike. Our lives are the same. Our likes and dislikes are the same. No difference means no excitement. A spark of understanding. Being married to Blake might seem easy, but I think I'd get really bored or start looking for excitement elsewhere. He'd probably do the same. When he asked me to marry him, I got excited about the idea. But excitement isn't the same as love. It wouldn't be fair to either of us. I looked at the shiny diamond ring on my hand. I liked it a lot. With a sad sigh, I took it off and dropped it into my purse. Can we get started? asked. Tyson smiled a bit, amused by my determination. Did I say I'd agreed to help you yet? He replied. Our eyes met, my blue to his brown. You spotted the problem, and I shared my plan. I won't let this stop my career. What more do you need? I said, strong and sure. Tyson nodded, seeing that I was serious, and his last doubt faded away. All right, show me the last pot you were comfortable with, Tyson said, moving to sit beside me at the small table. I smiled, pulled out my books, and opened my notes. We spent the whole morning reviewing. He walked me through two more chapters, until he was sure I got it. He started missing things here. He pointed out. I remembered it was a few weeks after Blake proposed. How did Tyson know? I glanced at him, but he just looked curious and I gave a shy smile, focusing back on the textbook. Tyson patiently explained the formulas and showed examples. I made notes and felt the information sinking in. A difficult problem caught my attention, one that had frustrated me before. Why can't they explain it like you did? It makes so much more sense now, I said, annoyed. He shrugged. Different teachers have different ways, but math is math. Numbers have their own beautiful language. He checked the clock. Are you hungry? I nodded, smiling. I was gonna make a salad with grilled chicken. Is that okay? Tyson asked. I smiled wider and nodded again. 
Do these three practice questions while I make lunch, he said, pointing to the textbook. Yes, sir, I said with a grin. As Tyson went to the kitchen, I started on the questions. I finished the first two, but my mind wandered. I couldn't believe he was 58. He looked amazing, walking out of the lake, his silver hair shining in the sun. What's troubling you about the third question? He asked, breaking my thoughts. Sorry, what? He frowned. I said, what's troubling you about the third one? Oh, nothing, I just got distracted. I replied. He raised an eyebrow but handed me a lunch plate while I finished the last question. When I was done, he checked my work and confirmed I understood. Looks like you have this under control. After lunch, we'll do the next four chapters. You're doing well, so there was just a misunderstanding before. No, I don't think you get how much your way of teaching helps, I insisted. I'm not a teacher anymore. That's a shame. If you want my help this afternoon, drop it. I raised my hands in surrender. We started eating and the salad impressed me. The chicken was hot and spicy, a perfect match for the cool dressing. It's like spicy chicken wings in a creamy dressing, he smiled. Secret recipe. After a bit of eating quietly, I couldn't help asking, if you don't drive, do you go out other than for your morning swim? He gave me a thoughtful look, then decided to answer. I walk every day. I'll go after we finish the fourth chapter. Where do you walk? I asked. I walk along the lakefront road and back. Six miles. I have my gym clothes in my car. Can I join you today? I asked. He looked at me, seeing my hope. He seemed unsure, but finally agreed. Fine. I looked around, counting the pictures of Tyson and his wife. You have a lot of photos. You've changed so much. He glanced around and shrugged. As I said, the man in those pictures died that night. Everything he valued died. I'm not Professor Kane anymore. I'm just Tyson Kane. Is math important? Tyson froze, then looked into my eyes, daring him to change his words. Let's finish the tutoring he said stiffly. We spent the next three hours going through four more chapters. I took detailed notes and asked many questions. Tyson remained calm and helpful. As we finished the last chapter, I closed my notebook with a contented sigh. I now have extra knowledge. We even did a chapter beyond what the university is teaching. I know the methods and formulas. I'm going to ace the next test. I can feel it. Thank you so much. He nodded and looked away, his face showing worry. Ready for our walk? Christy asked. He stood up and stretched. She noticed his stomach muscles and couldn't help but be amazed. Yes, I just need to change. Let me put my books away and grab my gym clothes, she said, jumping from her chair. She quickly packed her books and ran outside. She switched bags in the car and brought her duffel bag back. You can change in the guest bathroom, he said. She smiled and went inside. With the door closed, she grinned. He had no idea what was coming. Tyson watched the bathroom door close and wondered how he ended up in this situation. It was George's fault for sending her here. She was very attractive and her outfit hinted at a well-kept body. He frowned, realizing she was young enough to be his daughter, maybe even his granddaughter. Trying to forget that, he went to his bedroom and put on his running tights. His knee was hurting, so no running today. He put on ankle socks, then went to the living room, locked the patio doors, and grabbed his keys. He sat by the front door to put on his runners. He heard a noise and looked up. He froze as she walked toward him. Her colorful runners and yoga pants showed off her fit body.